And Lee's Los Angeles Woo! Comic Con. This is our Geek Fest Filmmakers panel. My name is Chris Gore. Uh, I am from FilmThreat.com. I'm a big fan of this festival. I, I really love what uh, Bill Ostroff has been able to put together. Um, I, I really wish I had seen more of the films, but I'll get to hear about them. So my apologies for that. My panel obligations have kept me from being here, but um, it, when I'm overhearing the conversation, you guys are admirers of each other, so that's even better. That's great. Um, I'm gonna go, we have six filmmakers here uh, from the fest. Uh, we're gonna go down the line. I'll have each of them introduce themselves. And then I have questions that I'd like to ask all of you, so, um, and, then, and then we'll go to some questions from, the audience is mostly filmmakers, fans. What are you guys, filmmakers also? Yes, also your fans, yeah, and we'll go to some questions from our audience. But uh, James, why don't you kick us off, uh, tell us quickly about yourself and your film, and quickly about your, your movie, and uh, let's just go rapid fire down the line. Can do. Hi, my name is James Cox, writer and director of Control Alt Delete. Uh, it's a feature that's actually showing right now. Um, so let's stay here. This is fun. This is good. Um, and it's uh, it's about half, keep keep an eye out for us. Uh, Control Delete Movie.com is, is our website, and you can find out about distribution. Hopefully, we'll have news on that soon. Um, but it's about hackers, AI, and what happens when those two get together. It's not. It's it's quite a lot of fun, but it's definitely scary. Cool. Hello, my name is Josh Mahoe, and I wrote and directed a short film called Star Trek Wars, which has had the honestly an honor to be here with GeekFest all year long. I think it's been amazing what they've been able to do. It's a comedy about George Lucas and J.J. Abrams fighting over Star Wars 7, and uh, it's really great. We're celebrating Star Trek 50 this year. So uh, I did play earlier today, but we are also online now. We're all, the film is also available to watch online, and we also have DVDs. So anyway, thank you. It sounds like an excellent documentary. Yeah. <laughs> I can't, I can't. I really want it. That's cool. That looks cool. Yes? I'm Stephen Arm Louie, and uh, I did Sun Devil and the Princess. It's a short film. It's a samurai fantasy adventure. Um, it's uh, Mandy's here. She plays the princess. And uh, we've been going to festivals and comic cons and kind of like the stuff that I like. So we've been able to play it at like places like here and with Geek Fest. So this has been really fun for us. And we're going to be distributing it online. It's basically we shot a 30 minute teaser to kind of showcase what we would do on the feature, so that's been our goal, and we've been lucky to like really showcase the movie at places like San Diego Comic Con, here, Geek Fest, Wizard World, so it's been a fun journey for us. Cool. Um, I'm Althea, and I'm the director of Orphan is the New Orange, Woo! and it's, um, it's toured with uh, Geek Fest this whole year, and um, this is our last uh, Geek Fest screening, but we will be at Holly Shorts on Thursday, so that's exciting. Um, and it's a parody on Orphan Black, and Orange is the New Black, and the concept is, what if the lead of clones got sent to prison? <laughs> and so it's, um, we mixed all the characters. Like, it's pretty fun. And me and the, uh, the lead actress who plays all 11 parts are super geeky fans of Orphan Black, and we both like that. Cool. I'm Kathleen Bean. I'm a writer, director, producer. I'm here with my film 21 Days. It's a paranormal thriller. It's about three filmmakers who embark on a paranormal challenge by barricading themselves in a house so haunted no one's been able to live there more than 21 days in order to film the supernatural phenomena which occurs. Um, I've been on the Geek Fest tour for the past year with the rest of my uh, co-filmmakers here on the, on the uh, panel. Uh, we have some exciting news that we're going to have a press release coming out early next week for a distribution. So we're very excited about that. Yeah. And our, our film um, screens at 5 o'clock today, so I hope you can, can make it. Thanks. I'm uh, Jim Skinner, and uh, I produce all the films on Twitter's homepage. So uh, I don't know if you guys have seen, we do a few shows, Cheddar, uh, The Rally. Uh, we have a football game and a hockey game today that uh, we're running. So I put a lot of really horrible shows on TV. But my passion project was Deadly Class. We did a little short film based on the comic book Deadly Class. Cool. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all you guys here for your, um, just for your dedication and passion because I know that making independent films is not necessarily always about making money. I mean, I, I think all of us would love to get that elusive distribution deal, everyone here. but. Um, uh, 
uh, I, I think uh, uh, you know projects like these start with passion. So um, sticking with you, Jim, and then making our way back down this way, if you could talk about where you draw your inspiration, whether it's like from I have access to a house with a boat and I can make a movie there, which sometimes is an inspiration, like resources can be an inspiration, but it can also be stuff that you see in the news or on television or just things that you love and your passions. So um, can you talk about where each of you drew your inspiration? We'll make our way back this way. Sure, so, uh, you know, I really love comics. I'm a big, huge nerd, Star Wars, anything, you know, DC, universe. So uh, there's an independent comic uh, uh, named Deadly Class, and the author is Rick Remender. He's done a lot of stuff. Uh, and uh, he was very approachable, and, you know, I think if you do, if you do come in without an economic uh, incentive, like, oh, I just want to do this fan film, I just want to show it at Comic-Cons, and not, I don't want to, you know, make money off of it, then all those rights problems kind of go away because you're sort of in the fair use world, and so you can do the things you really love. And, uh, and then I feel like it kind of makes up for all the really schlocky stuff that I have to, you know, produce for money. And it's like, okay, I did one thing that was good, you know. Is it good to have that, like, that balance where it's like you've got, like, your day job, and then you've got, like, the passion, so it's like you kind of, I mean, you know, that you made it work. Yeah, I would never, I would never want to get paid for something that I love, because I would be like, okay, you know, when there's money involved, there's like advertisers, and what, you know, you start getting the advertisers' demands, and it becomes really uh, focused on not making art, it becomes focused on, you know, oh, we sold, you know, the Countrywide spot, and so Countrywide doesn't want to see this in your show. Mm. Uh, Kathleen. Yes. So when you when you ask the question, where do I get my uh, where do we get our inspiration for this specific project that we're here or, for? Or, or, or I mean, you could yeah, I, either way, but yeah, for the specific project that's here, or and or like just in your creative life. Okay. Well, I always have, have told people that Twenty One Days was born out of frustration. Um, I've been an independent filmmaker for a number of years, uh, doing short films. Um, which had performed uh, pretty well on the festival circuit, and I was anxious to do my first feature, and the first um, script that I wrote, uh, which was a supernatural thriller, got a lot of heat in town. It had been a finalist at the Screen Fest Horror Film Festival a few, uh, several years back, and um, the film was financed uh, on five different occasions, with the first a $10 million budget, then $5 million budget, budget, then one million, then 500,000, then 300,000, and each time, financing fell through for a myriad of reasons, and the years were passing. And I realized I had to do something on my own, I had to write a totally different script that I could finance on my own, that my husband and I could finance on our own, um, and just get it out there, because I just was so frustrated, waiting, waiting for something to happen. And uh, so I wrote this script, 21 Days, that I felt could be done inexpensively, um, and that uh, was was commercial enough to potentially garner the interest from from studios. And so I set out to, to write a script that was, I mean, I've always been interested in the, the supernatural paranormal genre, um, had a lot of, ton of experiences as, going back to when I was a child with the supernatural and paranormal. And um, I wanted to write about this house that was so haunted that no one has been able to live there more than 21 days. So I was set out to write about this rich facts history about this home and the people that attempted to live there. And um, yeah, we, I, I sh we shot it at a 93 page script in 10 days. And I had just an amazing cast and crew to pull it off. But yes, I always say that my inspiration for this particular film was born out of, it was frustration. I just had to make something happen. It's, first of all, I love that you say that. I have a similar reason. <coughs> my first feature, I did the same way. I was just waiting for something to happen. I right. said, forget it. But um, what I love what you said is it reminds me of something Mark Duplass said. Um, in, he, Mark Duplass, the filmmaker, you guys yeah. know who he is. Yeah. Puffy Chair and Togetherness on HBO. He gave this great um, keynote speech at South to Southwest, and he said, the cavalry isn't coming. <laughs> You're absolutely and, right. And he just, like, so whatever resources he had, he's just like, I'm just going to make what I have with what I, I make something with what I have, because right. the cavalry's not coming, and you're having the budget go up and down, and oh, this, yeah. and you're making compromises, and you're just trying to get the, after a while, and so, so I love that. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. So, Althea, tell us about your project and where you draw your inspiration. Well, it's funny because um, Jennifer Sorensen, who hired me to do the short for her, that was her inspiration, that exact quote. Oh, oh, the cavalry is not that she, she either watched it online or maybe she was there, I can't remember. But um, 
she was sent, I, she sent this script to me, um, and I loved it, and I got all the jokes, and I guess there was a couple directors in the running, but I got the joke, so I got the job. <laughs> um, so our inspiration for this specifically came from the two shows, and, and mostly came from Orphan Black. Um, yeah, it's a great show. So that's where this, which I've never done before, all my other work has been original, and I would answer that question on another panel that my inspiration comes from like National Geographic and like history and real life stories and like traumas that are in the world that need to be healed through education. Well, parodies and mashups are huge online, huge. Yeah. I mean, have the people from those shows seen your So mo I feel like a lot of the people have seen the shows. The creators of Orphan Black have seen the show. A lot of the actors have seen it. Um, my producer and I, uh, Meredith, went to the Emmys. Um, not this year, but the year before, right? We, we released it like the weekend before the Emmys, and we met a lot of those actors and were able to share it with them. And uh, one of my good friends um, works on Orf Orange, so he got it out to those guys. So a lot of them have seen it. We've had a great response online, like over 10,000 views, which I think is pretty, I don't know. <laughs> it's probably bigger now. That was actually the first weekend, so I haven't checked. Cool. Yeah. For, for me, Sun Devil is a very personal project because it's something I did, um, I did a version of this when I was in college, and, um, and this, this short film was really successful. I was really excited. It was a big uh, boost for me to move out to LA from the East Coast, start my directing career, and then uh, you know I was all excited. I'm like, I'm gonna get to make art and movies, and I did three features, and um, they're they're not very arty. They're <laughs> kind of shitty, and um, you know, like I did a leprechaun movie and a romantic comedy, and and it's cool because you get you're getting to direct features, which was the dream, but it's like they're not the dream project. So I met with this guy at a visual effects company, and you know, he was a special effects company, and he was, was actually about another horror movie, and he's like, he saw my my senior film, which was Sun Devil, which was stop motion, and he's like, you know, we can do this. We can like build this, and like if you pay for materials, we'll throw in labor, and we can just like go and shoot something really small and fun in the woods. And like, I know a bunch of martial artists, I know a bunch of people, and I said to myself, I said once I started doing features, I said I'm never going to go back and do a short because it feels like going backwards. But this opportunity came up, and I said, you know, I could die tomorrow and never have done my dream project. And this isn't the feature, but it gives me a big chunk of the feature, and it was like kind of like. I get to do my art again. I get to do not just the commerce, not just the resume building. I got to do something like I felt like was really personal. It was a it was like, cause like people are like how many what which movies have you done? I'm mean, like I've done these, but they're not my movies. They're <coughs> movies I've been hired to do. So this was really fun to kind of go back to the drawing board and do something pure again, and like where you're not answering, where you know like the producer isn't coming and being like this is my cousin. Give them these six lines to say in your movie or. The leprechaun's got to do this on this page, or he's got to. You got to have a scene where the leprechaun's smoking a blunt. You know, like, this is, you know, this is like Warwick. You know, Warwick Davis is this great actor, and he's like rolling his eyes. I'm like, it wasn't my idea. I'm sorry. And, but you know, it's just. I think sometimes you have to go back and kind of, you know, what resources you have, what kind of passion you have, and you have to like reinvest in yourself. And and like, it's it's like why why not? If people aren't willing to bet on you the way you want, you bet on yourself. Do you, do you find that like when it comes to people wanting to work on something that they're passionate about that they really love that like the money is not the reason to make that choice like I mean you mentioned they were willing to kick in labor for nothing yeah. I mean that's I huge. mean we had people working on this project that literally had no business working on a short film we had the Scotech brothers who James Carrot they they won Oscars they like you see in their office and they have an IKEA shelf with two Academy Awards from. Abyss and Terminator 2 and, Al and Aliens. I mean, they had no business working on our movie. Our actors had no business working on it. But you do something in this town in LA with passion and you get people excited. R Rob Berman did Star Trek, the JJ Star Trek. Him and his brother won an Oscar. He did our special effects makeup. He had better ways to spend his time than me nickel and diming him with my pocket lint <laughs> budget. And he, you know, he, but people get excited because I think the best people that he, in, the, in LA are artists and they're dying to do something beyond just make money. So if you come, if you have a really boiled idea that you're passionate about, it, it really feeds, it feeds people. It's really exciting. I'm, I'm just ecstatic with the group of people I've worked with. It's just been extraordinary. Wow. Josh. Well, you know, I think that that's really inspiring and I think that actually really holds true to us in a similar sense. 
Uh, we had actually made a film together prior to this, uh, another short film called Steven Spielberg and the Return to Film School. And it was a, <laughs> another comedy uh, based on the true story of when Spielberg returned to college after 30 years. Actually, our, our university, uh, so uh, our, myself and all of our friends were all from Cal State Long Beach, which is where he's from. So that, that did so well and it won some awards and we just, really though, the actual story, you know, Star Trek was coming back, Star Wars is coming back, uh, so much excitement about, oh, is JJ gonna be able to live up to the hype? And for me, how does uh, George Lucas give up his, his passion for the last 40 years? What's well, basically been his entire life. Six billion dollars, right? Yes. <laughs> um, That's how you give, yeah. But I'll say this much is, is uh, I mean, there's so many reasons why, why we do this, because we're passionate about it, maybe because I've, uh, it's, I'm really happy we got to do a Comic-Con, like we recreated a Comic-Con scene in the film, and I've been uh, an attendee of these, these type of things for 10 years, and so kind of including my personal uh, approach to it in there. But in the end, I think for me, uh, the reason why I would love to keep doing projects like these is because we have these amazing people uh, who are, some of them are new, some of them are veterans, uh, who have the passion, like like everyone's saying, and um, just getting to work with them and have the opportunity to, I don't know, just see the amazing things that people do, uh, and just have the honor of like being able to put that into your movie, basically. And what's been the reaction to the, to the film when you, when you screen it for people? I, you know, I'm really happy that it's been positive, because one thing that, the, and I'm actually really happy that it has been so timely. One of the, the jokes in there is that, you know, Star Wars and Star Trek are so against each other. And one of the themes of the movie has been, you know, we should, uh, you know, see eye to eye. And we should uh, appreciate uh, each other's differences like Gene Roddenberry would have wanted. And um, uh, people have been responsive to that and have enjoyed it. I've really appreciated that message. And I'm glad I haven't heard, like, Star Trek should have won or something. You know, it would be kind of sad if people were like, although the comment section on our YouTube page has some of those. <laughs> <laughs> uh, comment section on YouTube page is a hood. Yeah. So it's a high of scum and villainy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fest has been pretty much the ideal venue that we didn't know that we needed. Just 100%. I don't think this would have done nearly as well as anything else. Cool. James, let's. Uh, Tell us about where you draw your inspiration and passion. Well, I first I agree 100% with everything that's already been said. Um, I honestly, it's all about passion, and absolutely, um, I could say that the origins of my film in particular came from a place of frustration, you know, my working situation and stuff like that. Um, to go further, I would say, what happens the next day after you decide I'm going to go make a feature film, let's say, and uh, you got to actually do it. And you gotta have something that people are, it's worth doing. Um, I think one of the biggest inspirations for Control Delete because of those, that kind of scenario where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm sick of making movies for other people, I wanna make one for myself. Um, what, you know, you draw upon your limitations. And I think one thing that we all do as independent filmmakers is we try to find, you know, because we're not playing to a broad, the broadest audience ever, you know, we're playing to fans of, you know, granted the two biggest franchises ever, but you get into the backstory of it, right? And you know, Sun Devil pulls, you know, go pulls from you know ancient lore, and I mean, it, it, it has all these folkloric parallels. You're you're getting to something specific, right? That is, you know, I think that is something we can do that the big league can't. They can't play to the specifics of people's lives for the most part because they have to play to Hall H, or <laughs> uh, to, you know, much, much broader, um, you know, audiences where they can't, you know, take the same risks as we do. So, for me, you know, doing a story about hacking and about artificial intelligence, spoiler alert, um, not really, but, it, you know, it's a, you know, it, 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 we got to really focus on, okay, let's deal with some real computer science. Let's. Let's dive into you know the kind of ideas that the guys from MIT play with when they talk about AI. Not Ultron, as much as I love them, but that's an Android story, isn't it? Yeah, it's not about artificial intelligence and how that can change our lives. So we tried to pull from reality as much as possible, and in that, that was a strength because we could you know really delve into the computer science and get serious about you know the technical how the technical things can be interesting as opposed to. Um, 
you know, trying to have two robots beat the hell out of each other, which is fun too. No, 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 you know, but I couldn't make that. Somebody else had to make that one. <laughs> Where would you say, like, in terms of like um, budget, like, there's always that's always sort of like your your enemy, but also not having budget can be a source of inspiration. It's it's a it's a way to solve problems because. I've seen some Hollywood movies, and spending a lot of money does not always equal quality, right? It doesn't equal a passion or a vision. It equals a marketing campaign for a film. I'm thinking about like Michael Bay's movies. You know, they're all bloated and expensive and huge, but there's not a lot there at all. Um, so when it comes to you know your projects, is that sort of Lack of resources, almost like, I mean, you touched on it, your lack of resources is kind of like a strength in itself because you have to creatively solve issues rather than, you know, solve it by spending more money or digitally doing this or fixing it in post. So can you talk about maybe some of the creative ways you've gotten around the adversity you faced in making your films? And this will be a question, uh, we'll start with James and we'll go all the way down to everybody. If, if you're cool with this format of me asking you all the same question, I just want, I just want everybody to get kind of even time uh, to, to talk. But um, I, I, yeah, just address like the budgets and challenges and, and maybe a creative solution that you came up with. Um, well, I think all of filmmaking is you, you show up on the day and X isn't there, Y isn't what you thought it would be, this and that. I mean. You know, I, to use not necessarily a story from our film, although I have quite a few I can draw from one I think is a little bit more kind of fun, um, is the story of Orson Welles' Othello, where on the, on the day when they're gonna do this great, this great death scene, and you know, it, there are people are, it's very, very exciting, you know, a guy gets stabbed a whole bunch of times, oh man, but, um, you know, it's a big Shakespearean opera. Well, one thing that's hard to do about a period piece is when you don't have the costumes. And that was the day that wardrobe decided not to show up. <laughs> so, and you know, check this movie out, or, uh, Orson Welles' Othello. But he, on the day, decided, okay, it's gonna be in a bathhouse, everybody's naked. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you, that, 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 yeah, you can, you can hear the excitement you have, and you know, you've, you've never even seen this movie. But, you know, granted, you know, this, this isn't, you know, some sort of pornographic thing, but it was a way to solve that problem in a way that actually improved upon the scene. And I think any filmmaker who's worth their salt ends up in that situation, and it's how they resolve it that makes the difference, you know, or they fix it in post. That's the most, that's the most creative use of nudity I think I've ever heard. Oh, wow. Uh, Josh, you have a story that how you got around that? Like, Okay, yeah, so we, we make, we've made two of these now for ridiculously low amounts, just, just because we've had over 150 artists in the past, we've had a feed like 300 people over the course of just a few days, and so in order to get around that, obviously you have to find the right people who are in that position where they want to contribute, um, but I think um, by having to fundraise, it actually can, it's possible to open a few doors. I've met a number of my producers because I was fundraising and they heard about us. And, but when you fundraise, you have to tell everyone you know. You have to get it out as wide as you possibly can. And then you can get people that way. Um, that's been one thing that's been interesting about that. Uh, we partnered with Thunder Studios, which is a sound stage in Long Beach. And they gave us a uh, 100,000 square foot sound stage to shoot our battle scene for free. Uh, and normal, I heard Sprint paid a hundred grand for that the next day. <laughs> so we got that for free and you know, have working with them has been amazing. The one thing I did want to mention about it though is that um, uh, with the, uh, oh shoot, I, I, the budget. Uh, Do it, money. tell but, us. Um, oh, I, there's something important, something important. Um, oh, in film school, there's a lot of people who take money and then don't, don't do anything with it. Or they flush it all away, all into the camera department. They like buy one camera. Or they flush it all away into production design or something. Those are great things. But at the end of the day, you have to realize it's the story that counts. And I've seen movies that cost, you know, 10 grand or, or more, and they just, they don't do so good, and they don't really touch anything because they were so focused on one area or another, 
and did you know focus on the performances of the script. So in, in terms of making things on low budget, at least um, at least for me, it's helped me to zone in on like, okay, well, it's not going to look like a million dollars. What do we need to do to get around that and still make it enjoyable? Cool. I would I would say there's a few things about budget. I mean, I think I think one thing like two things that don't cost money is especially with genre kind of stuff, which I think we all are doing genre kind of films is story and design don't necessarily cost money. I mean, big, there are big movies that have terrible stories and terrible design. Like, if those are two things you can work on for free. Like, you can if, work on the story, make sure the story's good. If you're weak at story, read some books. Work with a writer. If you're bad at drawing, work with people who draw better than you. So and is it a matter of like kind of knowing your strengths and weaknesses? I think so. I think you have to be honest with it. I think you have to like really, like if there's something you like, this, this idea that the filmmaker does everything is insane. Like you have to work with talented people. And I think you work with people that are, if you're willing to, to not think you know it all and work with people that know more than you, you can get a better project. You can get better design, better story. And, like, and for low budget stuff, the film, to me, it's always made in prep. Like prep, if it's your own project, you're doing your own film, prep, storyboard, shot list, go to locations. Like when you're on set, every minute should be shooting. And I mean, obviously there's setups and all that stuff, but I mean, I've shot low budget movies where we shoot nine pages in a day and I've shot stuff where you shoot a page a day. I've shot commercials. And a lot of times you're on commercials and you have so much gear and so much equipment and such a big crew it's amazing how slow you end up working. Like, you end up, you're like, if I had less people, I could actually shoot this faster, and it might even look better. So, I mean, there, there, this idea that once you have a big budget, it's gonna be easier is not necessarily true. But you have- I think it just creates more problems. It can, it yeah. can. I mean, you have a really big footprint. You wanna move 200 people to a company move. That, that takes time. But if you're, if you, one thing you have control over as a filmmaker is you have prep. You can sit and you can really pre, like we, did storyboards on the whole film. We pre we we videotaped the storyboards, so we had like a little animatic of exactly what our fight scenes would look like, exactly what everything would look like, and that was just me and one guy. And we just sit there and we board it and we go over it and over it and over it. And that way, when we got to set, we knew exactly what we were shooting. Because you you on set, I mean, you're really there to record when you're on set. There's magic that happens. There's great stuff, but you can rehearse with the actors. You can storyboard. You can shot list. Everything set, you, that's, that's worth so much money right there. Because then you, you're getting there and everyone's ready, everyone's on the same page, and you can go fast and do beautiful stuff. Especially if like the stunt guys know what you're doing, the visual effects guys know what you're doing, everything's been drawn or a, a, appropriated in some way, then you're working like a big movie. But that just takes time, and you gotta be willing to put the time. Is, when you're the filmmaker, you put the time in. And if you put that time in, you get a lot more out of your out of your thing. I mean, Hollywood movies are they, they write the script six weeks before they do a movie. They're changing the script as they're going, and that's why no matter how much money they throw at it, the movie's still not good. But it, when you're doing your own project, do it right. Put don't chintz on prep, don't chintz on rehearsals. Work with the actors, work with the writer, work with the designers. Storyboard, 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 and show up to record, and it's going to be magic every time. Althea. Yeah, I would say the prep on a um, on a low budget is really important. We joke, you know, you can have fast, cheap, and good. Pick two. Um, so we did. Uh, well, one of the things. Which we, two did you pick? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I think uh, fast and good. Um, I made Jen raise a lot of money for this. Not a lot, but she wanted to make it for a thousand. And wow. I, not interested in making something for thousand dollars. I've been there, done that. Um, but one of the things I actually learned, um, well, you have to have tenacity. So we looked at a ton of prisons. We filmed in prison, and it, we ended up actually filming in a live prison, like a working prison for free. And we used their um, their what are these called? These things? Jumpsuits. Jumpsuits. We used their jumpsuits, and we just turned them inside out. And then we covered them with logos. So that costume that we had like looked into was going to be a hundred dollars per costume to do it proper the way we wanted. And then we just got the costume for free. And then it was like maybe ten dollars per costume for the, uh, the whatever they call the stenciling. Thank you, stenciling. That we just sewed on like a place downtown. Sewed them on for like five minutes. Oh, that's cool. So we did that. And the only time I just we just screened. The only time I could tell that we 
the costumes were inside out was when she comes out of having sex with someone. So I'm like, oh, she could have put her clothes on inside out. <laughs> like, you can see the seams, but only in that scene. So like, to be open to imperfection, because no one's going to see it except for you. And I don't think anyone else watching the short would see that. Um, so that was good. And I learned, actually, I art directed Dr. Vogel's sing-along blog. And I learned so much from working with Joss Whedon, who normally works with whatever budget he wants, right? And I would present stuff to him, and he'd be like, what's easier? And I'm like, this. And he's like, I love that. And I'm like, OK. <laughs> and like, you realize, really, the story is the most important thing. And all those like details that you could put a ton of money into don't matter. I mean, they matter. But they don't really matter that much. Inside-out costumes. <laughs> well, hopefully, we'll be hearing from this Joss Whedon guy is up and coming in his career. Yeah, he's pretty, yeah. I hope it he's, works for I him. I mean, yeah, it's a little web show. He's um, so that was fun. <laughs> uh, Kathleen, yeah. um, I agree that um, working with micro budgets forces you to be way more creative, mm -hmm. and it probably was the best training ground for me to do this ultra little budget film. Um, because you just have to be very creative and clever and figure things out. Definitely prep, being incredibly prepared is everything. Um, the one thing I was just non-negotiable about was finding the right house. And I spent four months traversing from San Diego to Riverside to and go as far as San Francisco, but I essentially put 4,000 miles on my car trying to find the right location. Because as we all know in Southern California, this is a very film savvy state, so people want money, a lot of money for locations. Um, so I, I just was determined to find the right house, and I wasn't going to go to the next step until I found that right house. Because again, it was the main character of the film. Uh, and we, we, we lucked out, we found the right place, and, um, and then I would say the next phase in production, again, talking about um, you know, being ultra prepared uh, as far as storyboard, storyboarding and finding the right actors. And one of the things I said to the actors, and my background is in acting, and I told the actors, I said, there's gonna be, the film was so technically complex, even though when you watch it, it doesn't appear that way, but behind the scenes, it was so complex, that I, I told my actors, you need to know your lines, you need to sh come prepared, because I'm not gonna have time to direct you. Because I, it was gonna be, and I selected the right actors, and of course I directed them, but minimally minimally. And so I spent about a month and a half, two months finding the right actors. And it was that, 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 because we shot essentially 10 pages a day, wow. essentially 10 pages a day. And by, by having to shoot that quickly, as a director, you got to make up your mind really fast. What's important? And then, you know, I had the, the first AD saying, got to move Kathleen, got five more minutes to get this scene done. Okay, so how am I going to cover this? And even though I have my shot list, I don't have the time to shoot everything I had intended to shoot. So what's the most important thing for me to shoot? So that's why I'm saying I, I, I wouldn't give it a, it was, this was the best film school I could have had is to, to I think for anyone, make a low budget film. And that's, that's the way you learn how to make a movie. You know, you just go out and do it, especially when you have no money. But, you know. Well, it's interesting, I, you, you focus on, um, I've heard, Production value, yeah. great production value comes from two things, which is location and talent. So I, I really feel like when, when, you know, I see a lot of indie movies and like, I can tell when people put effort into those elements. So uh, yeah, the same, same, on the same line. Yeah, so well, when I was uh, young, I never wanted to own more stuff than I could jam in a car and just be able to drive away. <laughs> and when I make uh, films that I care about, I feel the same way that if there's not a lot of gear and you don't have departments, so like you don't have a guy lugging a really heavy C-stand, like I'm against these heavy C-stands, you know what I'm talking about? Because <laughs> then you need a department and you need a grip truck and you need that guy who's got to lug that thing to the set and he's got to lug it back. So you got one guy who's pissed off and not happy and he's always on a smoke break. And like, you know, it's not a family. It's not like, oh, hey, we're all equal. It's like, no, that, that guy's got to take care of those heavy stands. And so when I see that kind of stand on a set, you know, a cheap, horrible, light thing that anybody could carry, including the actor, then I'm like, okay, that's going to be a good set. Because we're just, you know, let's pick up the stuff and we knock over the camera. The camera guy's not going to go, you know, like you see cheap DLSRs and LED lights and everything's light, then it's like your family and you're just getting it done. As opposed to all the, 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 you know, like you can't talk to the actor because you're the grip guy. Like I don't like those sets. 
we're, we've only got about 15 minutes left, so I want to ask everyone here, a really close friend is about to make their feature film debut. And they ask you for one piece of advice. It could be a filmmaking tip. It could be something really simple. It could be a thing you think is the one thing they should focus on. So your closest friend in the world is about to embark on their creative journey. What is the one thing you tell them they need to do? And Jim, we'll start with you, and then we'll come back this way, and then we'll open up to audience questions. But, but uh, what, what can you tell us, Jim? Do you, what would you tell your friend, actually? You know, I think if you're leading a film crew, you have one job, and your one job is to get along with everybody. Wow, that's good. So be nice, be nice is, is <laughs> helps, right? You are everybody's Robots, best friend. Right? If you're not exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You want to be everybody's best friend. If you're not everybody's best friend, then like you have some ego thing you're doing, and then it's like when it really comes down to it, and it's like you're an hour into overtime, and people are looking at you know leaving, like they're not going to pull in for you, right? Then it's going to be back to like ah, I don't want to get out of here. But if you're like the person they really are circled around and they love you and they want to do this thing, you know. Can I tell you a horrible tip I heard? that Michael Bay, Michael Bay does. This is a Michael Bay story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Michael Bay's advice uh, to a filmmaker, to a friend, this is true, to a filmmaker was to hire hot young assistants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The reason, right. the re he had a really specific reason. His reason was, he goes, when you go to tell the script guys that you were talking, we referenced earlier, he goes, you send her to tell them that things might run late. And everybody's, everybody's very happy. And so he would always send, if there's bad news that needed to be dispensed, he would send the attractive young assistant to dispense the news. And that was, that was just something I heard he said. So there you go. Um, Kathleen, what, is, uh, what, is your, what are you going to tell your friend the one, the one thing? Trust your instincts. Trust your judgment, because you're going to get a lot of people telling you what you should be doing. And at the end of the day, you've got to make that decision. So trust your own instincts. So my advice would be the same advice that one of my really good friends gave me. I was driving to my first day of set on a feature film. And he said, just remember that you are the first audience. You are making this film. If you're loving it, then other people will love it. And you have to love it because it's your film. So when you're watching those takes, you're the first audience. And that um, that like brought like such like stillness to me when I was when we were filming. So I'm, all the noise just went away. I'm like, am I enjoying what I'm watching? Yes or no? We'll do it again. I love that take. Let's move on. So that was really just like so concrete of an action I could do. Steve. Um, so this person's going to make their first. Year? Yeah, they're making that you. You're their closest friend, and you're giving that person advice. I would what say do you tell them the one my, my advice would be to make sure everyone in the room is more experienced than you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good you know, don't work with your buddies. Work with somebody who's like got ten years of experience. Because if it's your first time, you want to be guided by people. Because it's a, it's a, it, it takes a village to make a movie. And you, you, you want people around that really know what they're doing and are going to like, but you know, you want to be simpatico. Like you want to have like, see the same eyes, but they, they have so much experience, they're going to uplift the journey because you need people that are experienced and good. I mean, I've done the thing where I do it with all my friends and it's all our third thing we've ever shot. But man, when you're doing that feature, it's a, it, a feature because having done both, it's like a short is awesome, a short's fun, it's a week, it's two weeks, whatever. It's like you hang out, it's three days sometimes, everyone loves each other. You do a feature, you get into that third week, and it's, everyone starts hating each other. <laughs> the days, it's just never ending, it's the same project. So you want to make sure the people there are, are have the stamina to do the feature, because it's stamina for features is different than a short, different than a commercial. So you want people there that have done it before, that have you know, crossed the pond in the, in the boat and made it back. So I would, say, I would say experience is really important. Surround yourself by people that are more talented than you and more experienced than you, and it makes you look good. Cool. Josh? Tell your family and friends that you love them. <laughs> Give them a quick call. Um, of course, all these things, everything everyone's saying is completely true. My perspective is, you know, before you spend any money, before you spend a dime, before you invest too much anywhere, you know, put your writing uh, and put the credibility of the performances first. 
Um, people, I feel that people want to go to a, a film and be emotionally engaged. And so if you put that at the core of everything you do, whether it's the character's journey or the, emo the emotions you're trying to put into that story, that's what's going to sell. You know, you, people will believe many things, regardless of where you're at, but if they don't believe in the, the character performances or the writing, then uh, it won't work. And also just make everyone feel appreciated, pretty much, because especially when they're all working for free. <laughs> don't, don't you think that that's, like, that's almost currency on an indie film set, is appreciation and praise, yeah. because that is such an important thing that we almost never get when, you know, having worked corporate jobs, you know, uh, you don't, appreciation and praise is something that it's like, that's why they pay you money, because they, they don't give you that. But on an indie film set, appreciation and praise is something you can freely give, and that, that makes everybody work all that much, all that harder. So it's, it's, a great, it's just a nice thing that at the end of the day, as like yes. a director to like shake everyone's hand, and say thank yeah. you, like say thank you. You know that that goes along because it's it's hard work. I mean, every every department is really tough. That little bit of appreciation, I think people really respond to that, and it's it's just the right thing to do. It's a, it's a good courtesy. It's a good interaction. So you're not this artiste ignoring everybody. I agree. James. I don't know if I have something totally original. Just everything I've heard up here has been awesome. I've been like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but I would suggest, firstly, to pick your your project very carefully because you better be as in love with it on day one as you are three years later. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, if you're not, it's going to show, and more importantly, you're going to hate yourself. But it's a. Uh, that, you know, I'm very happy with my project, of course, but uh, but I think it's you know that's got to be the most important thing, and I'm just very thankful that I didn't get three years in and went like, oh god, I wasted my life. Um, secondly, more more specific, set up your your shooting day early in the process. It's magic because when you tell people I'm shooting January 5th, yeah. they go, awesome, I'm free January 5th. I got nothing going on then. You tell them, I'm making a movie, or I'm thinking about making a movie. Would you want to be interested? It's not very specific, is it? Yeah, it doesn't give them the sense of like urgency, like, oh, I better get on board. So set your production date, maybe right after you finish the script. <laughs> you know? But uh, there you go. It's great. Uh, first of all, you got great advice from everybody. This is a really good panel. So I, I, I love coming to doing panels like this, because uh, just sharing information. I think the indie filmmakers in particular are really good about sharing uh, information. So I want to thank you guys for, for that. And I want to go to our audience now for some audience questions, because we've only got, uh, we've got about maybe seven minutes. So um, any audience questions? Yes, sir, right here I in, actually the, in, have, the, in uh, the hat, Star Wars hat. How you doing? Uh, I actually have uh, uh, the two middle. Uh, I have a question. I have two questions, or I asked a question for both of you. Um, what do you think is the, what were, what were the biggest stumbling blocks that you experienced in order to get your projects off the ground? Or two middle, two middle. Uh, sure, well this project, I'm not sure I experienced any stumbling blocks, to be perfectly honest. Um, in the interview actually, I set the shoot date. I was like, <laughs> oh, wow. I was like, she wanted it to be ready for the Emmys and I said, oh, well we have to shoot this day. And she's like, oh, we're already setting a shoot date? I'm like, yeah. Well, how is it going to happen if we don't have that? It yeah. won't. And so, um, I, I hate saying that, all that, but there were no stumbling blocks for this particular project. Awesome. I think for, uh, for us, I think post-production was really tough. It was, uh, like, we, we had a lot of visual effects. Um, and, uh, you know, it just, what happens, I think, in, L in LA specifically, is you get a lot of promises from people. And I had a lot of promises on the back end for post, and then we were finished with the movie, and like one of the the main post house that was going to do the work, they closed. So it was like starting from scratch. So that was like a big stumbling block. I would say, uh, if you're doing something, be careful with visual effects and post production because you can really, really paint yourself in a corner. We were lucky that we we shot everything, almost everything practically, but be very careful with visual effects because everyone's like, oh, it's just a visual effect, like kind of almost like it's like a button you press and it's done. But visual effects can if your project is visual effects dependent, you can really paint yourself into a corner and then end up getting not either not what you want or something that really brings down the quality of your project. So I would say be very judicious with visual effects on a lower budget project. Even a high budget project, just you know, they, I think they've become too reliant on visual effects with 
everything. So you don't want to ever paint yourself into a corner when you're done with the movie because getting it off the ground is hard enough, making it is hard enough, but man, when you're in post, there's, you're, you're so limited to what you can do. So be careful with those all green screen sets and stuff like that because, yeah. <laughs> Um, other other questions uh, before we have to wrap things up. Anyone? I know you guys have burning questions. <laughs> Anyone? Oh, All right. Uh, well, what we'll do is um, any any final thoughts from any sort of throw it out there. Final thoughts before we uh, wrap it up um, for for everyone here. Sometimes Just we do from next anyone. projects. Sometimes we ask about next projects. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Like what, what are you guys up to? And then also where we can find you and and, and whatnot. So we'll. Jim, we'll start with you and then come back this way. Sure, so I'm working on Monster Hunter Girl. So if you go to monsterhuntergirl.com, you can see what Monster Hunter Girl is all about. Cool. I'm currently uh, raising financing for my next feature, uh, The Maple House, which is a supernatural thriller. Um, you can find 21 Days at 21daystofilm.com. And like I said, they, uh, we just secured distribution uh, for US and Canada. So a press release will be coming out this coming week. Uh, I'm working on a feature that we're um, raising funds for. We just finished the script, and uh, we have an agency working with us now to uh, package it and get some star talent attached. It's pretty exciting. He's told me I can't talk about it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. I've talked about it a lot, but I'm just <laughs> giving new orders. <laughs> cool. So uh, we're trying. We're, we're basically trying to turn our Sun Devil uh, short into a feature, so we're just like going out with it and just kind of rounding out the film festivals and comic cons, and um, we're going to go online distribution with it. So, you know, because we're just kind of finished up our tour with the cons and festivals. So we're going to put that online. And, um, you can check it out at sundevilfilm.com. So we're trying to make the big Sun Devil epic feature, and we're also doing like a, a smaller movie that uh, one of the actresses I worked with on Sun Devil, she wrote her own project. So we're working on an, another, hopefully a new film for next year. Um, it's still being written. Uh, that's a tough phase, right? <laughs> but uh, we're, I just, you know, it's kind of crazy. We're going to probably do another fan thing, and uh, I would like to do a drama that takes uh, characters from the world of Pokemon. Uh, if anyone grew up with that, Ash, Misty, Brock, and see where they are today. Uh, and so please, I hope you get a chance to follow us online. Uh, I have cards for our films, uh, so see me afterward. But you can just Google Star Trek Wars, check out our film online, it's free to watch. And please follow us on you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, because we're going to do another one. And uh, we'd love to take you with us with it. So thank you. And thanks to everyone. Seriously, cool. it's been great getting to know everybody here for the last year. Yeah, so um, I have a comic book that is going to be wrapping up its fifth issue, I believe. Um, it's a new title called The Boatman, um, in time for WonderCon as our plan. Um, so I'm very excited to share that once that is out. Um, in the meantime, I'm uh, getting ready for our next feature. Um, I can give you a bit of an exclusive. It's called Amber Alert, and uh, we're working on packaging it with our sales agency. So hopefully good things will happen there. Um, in the meantime, keep your eyes on controlaltdeletemovie.com or on Facebook, Control Alt Del Movie. Um, we will be hopefully having some announcements soon in regards to distribution, which means all you people can see it, so that'd be awesome. Cool, and um, I'm, uh, I'm that Chris Gore. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that stuff. You can just look up that Chris Gore, and I'm also relaunching my website next year, filmthreat.com. Starting in January, you'll you'll get to read the, the site every day. I want to thank you guys. Uh, great panel, great advice from all you guys, and thank you for your just your creative passion and, and dedication to getting your projects done. I know how difficult it can be, and, and thank you uh, for coming here to check out this panel. I know some people that are here have never been to a Comic Con before, so I want to say thank you for coming here and joining the Nerd Tribe. Big round of applause for you guys.